Romans 7, beginning at verse 14, reading to verse 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, Paul has been instructing the Roman church concerning the grace of God. And he has clearly made it plain to them that it's God's grace that changes lives. God's grace has been referred to as his unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. And his unmerited favor transforms a person from the inside out. Now, it's not the result of our trying to be good. It's not a result of me following certain rules, regulations. It's not found in me attempting to obey certain things that I have been taught in and of itself. The way that I have a relationship with the Lord is not going to be the result of keeping rules, but it comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul has been contrasting grace with law. And he has made it very clear that there is a purpose in the law, but it's not by keeping the law that I'm going to have a transformed interior. That comes through faith in Christ. Now in Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, we read, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So it wasn't through the adherence to a particular set of rules, a code of laws, but it's through faith in Christ, and that's the point that Paul has been making. Now, many could not accept what Paul was teaching. They argued that you needed rules in order to please God. So Paul argued that the law was good, indeed, because it identified our sin and also because the law reveals our Savior. The law is good, Paul was arguing, because it gave us God's mind and what is right and what is wrong. And the law is good. But God's grace is far better because we cannot totally obey the law of Moses. So how does grace affect us? How does grace affect the way that you see yourself? Does God's grace give you a deep sense of arriving as a spiritual person? Because there are those who would say or argue that, seeing that we don't need the law, then we don't need to, to follow anything that has been uh, codified in any sense of the, of the word. We're just totally free to do what we will and continue in that way and go to heaven. And, and anybody who would have this idea that, that you haven't fully arrived, well, you must not have come to a full sense of what real faith is and what grace truly is. There are, there are many people that I've encountered over the years who think that if you have a sobriety, a soberness of mind towards the things of God, that you, you must not know God very well. You must not have the joy of the Spirit. You might find this interesting that when I was a candidate to be ordained into ministry as a pastor back in 1979, that the board was assembled and they interviewed me and one of the board members said to me, David, frankly, I hesitate to, to recognize you, to ordain you. He said, because frankly, brother, you just don't seem to have any joy. 
And I remember smiling at him when he said that and getting up and walking up to him and, and hitting him with a bat. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> I just wanted to. I would have enjoyed that, but he said, you don't, you don't have any joy. And uh, as, if, as if smiling all the time and, and laughing all the time is a symbol of knowing Jesus. I never understood it then. I don't understand it now. One of the requirements for a man to be an elder is sobriety, to be soberness of mind. And that should have been recognized as being an earmark of somebody who's moving with the Lord. The bottom line is that you, if you get closer to the Lord, may find yourself more aware, you will find yourself more aware of your own condition. This is what Paul is speaking about here in this particular portion of Scripture. Those who are moving closer to Jesus actually have the joy of salvation, of course. But they have a sobriety, they have a soberness, they have an awareness. And one of the things they're aware of is what it took for God to save them. And also, they're aware of their own selves. And they're also aware of how far they fall short of being what they truly in their heart of hearts would love to be. And Paul is going to be speaking concerning that in this passage here. Now, as we look at this here in Romans chapter 7, there's a lot of discussion concerning the person being spoken of in this portion of Scripture. There are some who believe that Paul is speaking of someone who simply doesn't know the Lord. They say that the one being described here in Romans 7, 14 through 25, obviously doesn't know Jesus Christ. And so as they're saying that, they'll point out various things. Notice verse 14. They'll say, this cannot be a person who knows the Lord, because look what he says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Notice verse 18. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Notice verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So they'll say, based on this, it's evident he's not speaking of a believer. Then they point to what he has already written in the previous chapter, in chapter 6. Because if you remember chapter 6, verse 2, chapter 6, verse 2 reveals that believers have died to sin. Chapter 6, verse 6 states that believers are no longer slaves to sin. Chapter 6, verse 7 says believers are freed from sin. And then chapter 6, verse 11 communicates that believers are dead to sin. You've died to sin, no longer slaves to sin, you're freed from sin, you are dead to sin. So with this in mind, they would say Paul cannot possibly be writing of a believer in Christ. But then again, you have others who would argue differently. Others say Paul is undoubtedly speaking about a Christian believer. Chapter 7, verse 15 describes someone who wants to please God and hates doing evil. Chapter 7, verse 18 re uh, points out that, that he humbly recognizes no good dwells in him. And then again in verse 25, that verse reveals that this person gives thanks to God through Jesus and he serves him as his Lord. None of those things pertain to unbelievers and therefore the argument would be that this is being spoken of a redeemed man. Now, if it's a redeemed man, then once again, who is he speaking of? Well, that would be quite obvious to us. It seems obvious that Paul is writing of a believer and that he's speaking of himself. Why would we say that? If you were to look at verses 14 through 25, and I just read this to you, he speaks in the first person 38 times. 38 times. I, myself, me, 38 times in these few verses, he is speaking of himself. Now, some think that more spiritually mature uh, people will grow past a sense of unworthiness. They, they believe that such an attitude is beneath a genuinely mature Christian. And I've had that stated to me in the past. Again, I mentioned that somebody had said to me, um, I really don't think we should ordain you because you don't seem to have joy. Uh, I remember giving a Bible study when this church was very young, and an individual walked up to me after the service and said, that was a, a good Bible study, but it was so serious. You're so sober when you do that. And uh, I've had comments like that over the years, and there are those who, who think that when you go to church, you're supposed to walk out you know, skipping and, 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 uh, and laughing and all. And, and from my perspective, I, I think that it, it's great to have the joy of the Spirit and it's great to have uh, burdens uplifted, of course, but, but we're not discussing that in this passage. What we're speaking about in this passage is 
is what are the genuine internal struggles that a believer can actually have and still be a believer? And in, is this an earmark of somebody who has a solid faith in Christ, or is it somebody who's got a disproportionate sense of uh, residual guilt? What is it that's being spoken of here in this particular passage? You see, it is true. Believers are forgiven. Believers are new in Jesus Christ. We are overcomers because of Him, but it is also true that the closer you get to Jesus, the more humbled you become in His presence. When I was growing up, and I'm still growing up at my age, but when I was younger, attempting to grow up, my mom had something that she used when she applied her makeup. It's a makeup mirror. I don't even know if they still have those things anymore. When I go outside sometimes and I look around, I wonder if they have makeup mirrors anymore. But anyway... Um, <laughs> It had these different lights, you know, different intensity of light. You could have like bright sunlight and then another light that's a little less and all the way down to indoor light. And, and I discovered something as a kid. I would use my mom's makeup mirror to apply my makeup, no, to uh, comb my hair. I would turn it on and, and, and I used to wear a pompadour and so I would spray it and then I would form it, you know, until it was just right. And, um, and I discovered something with the makeup mirror. If I had the, the light, the intensity of the light real low, I always look good. <laughs> I always look good. Man, you're looking good. But when I turned the light fully on, I saw all kinds of things that clear still could not fix. <laughs> because the light shows the imperfection, right? It does. Everybody looks beautiful at 3 o'clock in the dark in the morning. But during the full bright sunlight, when we walk out after this service and the lights out there, we see ourselves for what we are. Everybody thinks of themselves as being beautiful. But the light of the word of God reveals to us what we are, you see. Most people like to live in the darkness. But God's light wants us to have those things revealed. So a person who says, you know, I... I just don't feel good about where I'm at with the Lord. If they're sincerely pursuing him, that's not a negative. And anybody who would come and argue and say, oh, you're so serious, is probably not as serious about their own faith as he should be. It's not that we should walk around with sackcloth, ashes, and whips beating ourselves daily. But it is that I should be aware of who I am in the light of who he is. And the closer you draw to Jesus, the more aware of yourself you become. And that result isn't for you to run around saying, oh, how terrible evil I am. It's part of it will say, oh, Lord, I have been evil. But it also is, but God, you're so righteous. And I want to serve you and please you. And instead of me putting my eyes on myself, when I put my eyes on him, I have a tendency of seeing myself in his reflection. You see, Christians who are maturing in their faith become sensitive to sin for various reasons because we're living in what is called a dynamic tension. It's a tension between the now and the not yet. Uh, we are not what we want to be, but we're not what we're going to be either. So it makes us sensitive to our shortcomings. It provokes us to humility, and, and it makes us sensitive to sin. Because we know that sin grieves God. It grieves the Spirit of God. Ephesians 4.30 makes that clear. Grieve not the Spirit of, of God. And, and, and so we know that, that sin grieves God. And, and we know that sin also blocks my communication with the Lord in prayer. It affects my prayer life. Because Peter said in 1 Peter 3.12, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayer. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I know that my sin is going to disrupt my fellowship with God and with others. Uh, that's why if I walk in the light as he is in the light, I have fellowship one with another. And, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so I know that these things are true. I know that, that sin will, will rob me of the joy of salvation. Uh, Psalm 51, 12 says it like this, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. See, so I know that sin grieves the Spirit of God. It affects my prayer life. It disrupts fellowship. It robs me of the joy of salvation. And therefore, I am as a believer to take it seriously and not to disregard it. And so sin is ever-present. It's ready to rule a believer. So we cannot take its influence and impact lightly. That's what Paul's talking about. 
even though we may be born again, there is still a struggle internally for domination, and it's been referred to as the war within. Now, Paul is speaking concerning this in verse 14. Notice verse 14 when he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. He says that the law is spiritual because the law deals with spiritual principles of life and salvation. And the law reveals that it's not only my actions that are unacceptable, it's my motives and the inclinations of my nature that are unacceptable. It's not simply the things that I do. Because a lot of people have a tendency of cleaning up the outside. The Pharisees were very good at that time of doing that. They'd stand in street corners and pray. They would give ostentatiously. They would fast to be known by men. And Jesus said, look at them. They do the three basic things that religious people do in Jewish society that are deemed religious activities, fasting, prayer, giving. All of those are things that believers do. But he said they do it to be seen by men. They would wear a particular robe and they would broaden the edge of it so that people would see that they were of a religious sort. They'd wear what were called phylacteries and uh, they were known for their religious symbols that they wore. But Jesus, speaking of them, said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're clean on the outside, but inside you're filled with decay because it's all exterior and it's not hard. It's not hard to have an exterior kind of religiosity. A lot of people have that. Oh, we go to church. We carry a Bible. We have bumper stickers. Uh, we like certain music and all of those things. It's, it's exterior. Well, Paul is saying, listen, it goes deeper than that. It, it, it's not simply taking care of the outside because, because the word of God and Jesus himself speaking in such a way reveals that it's, it's what's going on inside that God is concerned about. Matthew 5, 27 and 28, as an example, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you have the opportunity to do it, you're going to do it. You've already committed it. The act is as good as done, even though you haven't consummated it with a physical activity. Why? Because it's the interior that Jesus is looking at, and the heart is what he's concerned about. So he says, the law is spiritual because it reveals my motives. He says, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. I am still living here on earth. I'm dealing with the desires that are sinful. Now, he's not saying that he does all his inclinations that are being provoked within him. He, he is saying that he's still imperfect. He deals with his flesh daily. He's talking about a warfare that takes place in the heart of a believer. You see, you can love God deeply, but still have desires that war within you. That's because you haven't entered into heaven yet. You haven't entered into perfection. So that war continues. In 1 John 1, 8, it simply says it like this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. So sin takes everything we do. It frustrates our desire to please God. And Paul is speaking about that. Notice verse 15. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For, I, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. So I find myself doing what I don't want to do. My desire is to measure up to God's law, but in reality... I still fail to do so. I want to fulfill both the spirit and the letter of the law, but I, but I can't. Now, he's not battling a besetting sin. He's not feeling guilt over past sins. Sometimes we may be held captive to past sins. We think that we've never changed, we'll never change, and sometimes we have people whispering in our ear, you're still the same as you've always been, and you might be captive to your past. Paul is not dealing with that. Paul is not dealing with low self-esteem. He doesn't have low self-worth problems of any sort. In regards to his past, he knew it's past. He knew it's done. He knew it's over. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed him from all sin. He knew that. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Paul knew that God, through Jesus Christ, had washed him clean. He was a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things were passed away. And so when he would write concerning that reality, he was very clear about it. When he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, he said it like this. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, 
But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I was the chief of sinners, but God used me as a template, as an example, so that people might say, even he who is insolent, arrogant, persecuting the church unto the death, even he could be forgiven. He says, and God showed me his mercy. So no, Paul was not dealing with residual guilt. He was not running around saying, oh, look at what I've been. I'll never get over that at all. He was simply saying that he in the past had done certain things, but his awareness of what it cost Jesus had humbled him. He says in verse 16, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law. It's good. You see, my desire to do the right thing reveals that the law is doing its job. My internal desire to please God reveals I've been born again. You see, when you begin to mature in Christ, your desire to please God does not decrease. Your desire to please God actually begins to increase. The things that you, when you're a new Christian, might not have much of a, uh, create much of an impact on you in the sense of like you feeling real bad about it. There may be certain things that you continue to do without even really any thought about it. You haven't been taught yet about what is pleasing to the Lord. And so you might continue to do certain things and make excuse for it. But when you're in the Word of God, guys, when you begin to fellowship, when you begin to have friends who have walked with the Lord for a while and you begin to have the influence of, of God's Word, His Spirit, and those who love Him in your life, you begin to realize that certain things are not pleasing to God and you begin to move away from those things. And it's a very natural thing that occurs. Bottom line is, is you begin to desire to please God more. But at the same time, he says in verse 17, you understand it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So there will be an internal struggle. And that will be an internal struggle to be, be obedient. He's saying, I retain a natural inclination towards a life of sin. But I no longer naturally approve the sins that are still produced by my flesh. I don't want to do those things anymore. Paul, when he was writing in Galatians 5, verse 17, said this. He said, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a war that takes place within. You aren't what you want to be. You haven't grown to that place. And you can get to the point in your life where you're frustrated even. There's a sense in you that says, I am tired of this. I don't want to be this way anymore. So he wasn't in terrible sin. He just couldn't do the things always that he wanted to do. He desired to serve the Lord completely. And it grieves him that he's not always successful. Now, in verse 19, he says, the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but... I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. My natural desires are not to please God. They actually go against pleasing Him and obeying Him. I haven't arrived, but I have a sense that I have further to go. So I want to live a victorious life. Now, how do I live a victorious life? How am I going to be able to grow in the things of the Lord? I need to, as a believer, I need to abide and walk in the grace of God and in His power. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I, I need to take God at His word. I need to trust in the Lord. I need to daily cling to Him. Just like it says in, in Joshua 22, 5, where it says, Take careful heed to do the commandment, of, the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. To love the Lord your God to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, serve him with all your heart 
with all your soul. So we come to Christ. And when you come to Jesus Christ, he forgives you of all your sin. He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. He makes you a new creation. And he gives to you an ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to live a victorious life. Yes, but I need to, to rely on him on a daily basis. Uh, it's like the manna that God had told the children of Israel to collect and to, to live on. He said, on a daily basis, collect the manna. On the sixth day, collect twice as much because you're not to work on the seventh day. But what he was saying is, I can give to you your daily bread. And it's something you need to sustain you on a daily basis. That's why Jesus would teach us, he who is the bread of life would teach us to pray daily, give us this day our daily bread. That we might continue to be sustained by the power of God in our devotion to him and in our walk with him. But he has given to me what is necessary for me to live. It says in 2 Peter 1, 3, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who who called us by glory and virtue. So he has made it possible for us to have that. Now, what we rely on isn't our efforts, but on his grace, because we know that his grace is enough. There's an instance in 2 Corinthians 12 where the apostle Paul is writing concerning something that he had. It's referred to as a messenger from Satan that has been sent to buffet him. It's called a thorn in the flesh. That word thorn in the original language is not just a, a thorn like you see on a rose, but it is a tent stake. And he says, I'm impaled by this thorn. And he says, I asked God three times to release me from it. And he said, God gave me an answer in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Rather than running away from these things, I embrace the reality of it. And I know that God is using it in my life for good, teaching me to rely on his strength and to be aware of my own weakness. Now, a mature believer will grow to understand that. Instead of constantly saying, get me out of here, I need to get out of this, this situation, what we do is we seek the Lord for his relief, but at the same time we grow in understanding of what he's training us in, what he's teaching us to do, and what to experience so that we might be a help to somebody else. On one occasion, I went to speak to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, and Marie and I were going through something, and I wanted his counsel, and I was seated there speaking to him, and I shared something about the length, the duration of, of this struggle that we'd gone through, and and Chuck said, well, you know what? He said, some things you have to go through in order to learn. And I said to him, I said, Pastor, I said, can't I read a book or something to help me understand that? He said, no. He said, some things you go through that you might, became, that you might not only be comforted, but that you might be one who can bring comfort to those who need comfort in their time. He said, God uses these things to increase and strengthen you. God uses these things to make you into the vessel that he chooses and shape you into that vessel that he can use. And so God's grace is sufficient. In the midst of all the struggles, in the midst of the terrible times, in the midst of the trying times, of the painful times, in, in the midst of the awareness that we can have of ourselves and where we're at and what we're not doing and what we ought to be doing in the struggle within that we have, that war that's going on, what we do in the midst of that is determined to stay in God's word on a personal level we remain strong by, by staying in our devotional life, getting up in the morning and taking time before you do anything else to read the Word of God. We commit ourselves to, to studies, to, to grow. I don't know if you appreciate this church very much. Some do, some don't. Some are visitors, some will never come back. I understand the dynamics of churches. I'll tell you this, this church would not exist if it weren't for God using my mom and my dad to awaken in me a desire to teach the Word. This church as it is right now, when you walk in, you see this building, you see 13 and a half acres of property. You see buildings all over the place, cafes, bookstores, children's ministry. You see so much that exists. You may think that it just basically always was always there. It was not always there. That is something that God gave us vision for over the years, and it's what has happened over the years since we planted this church. But this church really didn't begin here on this location. This church really began in September of 1973 in the city of Norwalk. 
and it began with a mother and a father, a dad and a mom, my mom and my dad, who when I had gotten out of the military and I had come home and I had seen that they weren't growing in their faith in Christ and I'd been gone for almost two years and they were not maturing, it began when I came home and I began to sorrow over the fact that they weren't growing and I made a determination that somehow I was going to help them. And I went to Biola and when I went to Biola in 1973 as a Christian service assignment, I began to teach home Bible studies and my mom and my dad as well as my sisters, which were the original members of that Bible study. My mom was part of my Bible studies from the time I began. She was a part of the very first one I ever gave, and my mom was part of Bible studies for years and years and years. My sister Rebecca wrote me today, and as mentioned, my mama went home to be with the Lord on Thursday, and she went to be with Jesus at 1216 in the afternoon. My radio program goes on in the Albuquerque area at 11.30, from 11.30 to noon. My sister Becky turned on my radio program so that my mom, though she was in a coma, could listen. My mom in her last few weeks had slipped and slipped and slipped further and further and further to the point where she was sleeping most of the day and finally went into a comatose state. And Becky wrote me today and she said, David, I didn't tell you this. She said, I wasn't ready to, but I'm tell I'll tell you now. She said, on Thursday, I turned on your program, turned the volume on so Mama could hear. And when the volume was loud, she said, Mama, who'd been comatose, stirred. And she opened her eyes and she looked around the room because she heard your voice. And the last thing Mama heard before she went home was your Bible, was a Bible study that you gave that welcomed her into the presence of Jesus Christ. My mama would have loved, and I say this with passion, and I hope it doesn't come off wrong, my mama would have loved to have been able to be where you are right now. My mom would have loved that. She moved 12 years ago to Albuquerque. She missed me and this church every day that she remained alive. She would listen to me every day. She would put me on the computer to hear me speak. I would, in her last days, I, I recorded prayers so they could put earphones on her ears so she could hear her, her son, whom she loved, pray for her. She would watch me and she would listen to me and she had such a joy in the spirit that God had given to her because of the word of God. Mama would be here on a Wednesday night if she could. Mama would be here on a Sunday night. Mama would be here for everything that she could be part of. Why? Because David was her, her son and he's the pastor. No, because Mama had a hunger for the things of God. We who are healthy, we make choices to do what we want to do. Choose the right things. I don't want to pastor a lukewarm church. I do not want to pastor a group of people who think that once in a while is good. I'm a Jesus freak. As old as I am, I am a Jesus freak. I believe there's only one reason for life, and that's Jesus Christ, to serve him. That's the bottom line. And I've never wanted, and I've never wanted to pastor a group of people who don't care. I want you to look at your own hearts. I'm asking my church, I've done this all three services today, where do you really stand with Jesus? When you hear that there's an opportunity to serve, to worship, to be in prayer. Listen, there is a group of people called Islam, they're Islamicists, Muslims, who the devoted ones pray five times a day for your destruction. They want the advance of Islam and they want Christianity, which they consider to be a, a lesser faith, they want it to be overthrown and destroyed through the power of Islam. Do you know that? Perhaps you don't. They pray five times a day. You can go through some mall and you will see a devoted Muslim on their face praying towards Mecca, and they do that five times a day to remember that their whole day ought to be in uh, awareness of the presence of whom they call God. And the church has a prayer meeting. Nobody comes. Why? Because it's not entertaining. It's not fun. It doesn't fulfill my needs. 
something's wrong with the church in America. Something's wrong with churches all through the nation. And something's wrong even with this one. I am saying this as a pastor. I'm saying this as one who loves you. Check your hearts. See what really matters to you. Because I guarantee you, half the people listening to me right now could care less. The other half are listening with half an ear. And there's only a small percentage that really care. Are you part of that small percentage? Now, it doesn't matter to me if you stay in this fellowship or not. It's up to you. Go where God calls you. I didn't start a church so I could fill this place up. So anybody who thinks that way doesn't know me. What I want is saints. What I want is on fire believers. What I want is an army marching for Jesus Christ. I want people to reach into the world and save the lost. That's what I want. And that's what I've always wanted. And so I'm asking you to check your own heart. I'm asking you to look within because we make a lot of excuses in our own hearts as to why we do or do not do certain things. What I'm saying is I want you to be on fire for Jesus Christ. And that's my guarantee to you. Every time you come to this church, I will do my best to exhort you and encourage you and to love you into loving him because that's all that matters. Listen, one of these days I'm going to be in heaven because of Jesus. One of these days I will see my mom. One of these days I will see my dad again. I will see my grandfather and my grandmother and others that have come to faith in Christ through ministry that I have performed or that was performed by others faithfully. You see, and I want you to be there too. I want us together to rejoice in the things of Jesus Christ. So the passion in my heart is, is firm and it's been there since I was 20 years old. At my age, at 62, it's still a flame. It will be there until the day that Jesus says, come home, my good and faithful servant. My guarantee to you is I will always tell you the truth. And my desire for you is to follow Jesus Christ with all of your heart, with all of your strength. And yes, you'll have battles within. And yes, there'll be struggles. Don't take the easy way out. Firm up in Christ and say, I'm going to make it. I will do it. With Jesus, I can do all things. I will be victorious. I will enter into the kingdom of God. That's the only way it's going to happen. That's the only way. See, Paul was, Paul was a man who said, I see what I am, and I don't want what I see. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? What do you mean? Well, murder victims would be strapped to the murderers. If I were a murderer, I killed a person and it was demonstrated and I was caught. They would take that man's body, that I, the man I murdered, they would strap him to me. And he would slowly but surely decay. He would putrefy and his decay would begin to infect my body. I was literally killed by the one who killed me that I killed, rather. I was killed by the one I killed. His dead body rotting on mine killed me. Oh, wretched man that I am. I've got this, this body of death. I've got this thing within me, this inclination to evil. Who will deliver me from that? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ. Jesus sets us free. No matter what it may be that I'm going through, and no matter how as I see myself and say, Lord, I haven't arrived. God says, no, you haven't but one day you will. So Paul is simply saying, we are to live by faith, awaiting ultimate deliverance. God is the one who rescues us, and we are rescued because of him. So, if you're one of these who says, Lord, I just want more of you. God, I, I don't like what I have been. I don't like where I've been. I don't like how I feel sometimes. God, I just want to please you. Then you're of the same kind of spirit that Paul had. It's not something negative, guys. It's something that actually motivates you to have a deeper walk with Christ. That has been, in my life, very true. You know, I weep sometimes, and I'll close with this. I weep sometimes. You hear me give my testimony, some things out of my testimony, and I can tear up and I get emotional because... I know what I was. I know what I did. I never want to go back. But it also humbles me to realize how much God loved me to give his son to change a wretch like me and to transform me into somebody who can help other people, perhaps some of you even, to love him more.
that's my greatest desire. And that began when I got saved. And I went across the street and I told some neighbors, you need Jesus. And I went into my parents' den and I said to them, God bless you, I love you. Praise the Lord. And brought my sister Madeline to Christ. And three weeks later brought my mom and my dad to Jesus. And then a couple of years later, my brother got saved. And then a young woman came to my Bible study who got saved, who became my wife. And then my sister, Becky, who struggled with lesbianism for 28 years, got set free by the power and glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of transformation. And if that means that sometimes I will say, oh, wretched man that I am, then praise God for it because he delivers us. And I want him to deliver you too. I want your life to be solid with Jesus Christ. That is my solemn pledge to you and my desire as the pastor of this church. If you want to go with me on a journey, then strap on because we're going. And if you don't want to, I hope there's a place you can do that in. But I'm going to follow Jesus.